Okay, we have now started the recording. So um, for the record, uh, this meeting is being recorded and may be shown on the Town of Barnstable's Channel 18 and may be available through the video on demand feature on the town's website. Uh, now that we have that out of the way, um, I can switch over to our presentation for this evening. Uh, can someone please confirm that you see the, the presentation in presentation mode? Perfect. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, so uh, welcome all to tonight's public presentation on Long Pond Diagnostic Nutrient Assessment and Management Plan. I am Amber Unruh. I work for the Department of Public Works and will be presenting the presentation tonight. With me, I have our consultants who performed the work for this uh, study and management plan, Dr. Brian Howes and uh, Ed Eichner. They work at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth School for Marine Science and Technology. Um, we should also have uh, town engineer Griffin Bowden with us tonight. I also see that we have um, the uh, town councilor or vice president Paula Schnepp with us. Thank you so much for attending. And also um, a shout out to Amy Mesro, the president of the Friends of Long Pond Association and other board members that I see here tonight uh, that we've been working with through um, on the development of this uh, management plan. And so with that, I'll, I'll jump into it. So just a real quick overview. The town of Barnstable has many lakes and ponds in this town, uh, and these are freshwater resources. There are roughly 180 uh, freshwater ponds throughout the town, uh, but only 25 of these ponds are designated as a great pond, meaning that they're greater than 10 acres in size. And so uh, a lot of those great ponds um, are scattered throughout the town uh, in various parts. Um, and unfortunately, we have information that indicates that most of these ponds are impaired to some degree. Uh, and, and so understanding that these resources have experienced um, you know, some type of eutrophication or degradation over time, the town decided to initiate a pond and lake management plan program in 2020. And in order to start that effort, um, the, the ponds that we have in town were prioritized using available data, in particular, long-term nutrient, uh, dissolved oxygen, or uh, habitat information, fisheries information, uh, cyanobacteria info, to prioritize these ponds and start to work through um, them one by one on about one per year annual basis to develop pond and lake management plans. Um, the prioritization revealed that Shubal Pond was at the top of that list and we actually completed that pond and lake management plan earlier this year. Next was the Long Pond Marsons Mills management plan which is what the focus of tonight's presentation is on. And third uh, is the Lovells Pond Management Plan Development, which is currently underway as of this year. Um, in particular concern for at least the three ponds I just mentioned, Long Pond, Marsons Mills included, is cyanobacteria blooms. Um, this pond prior to 2018 did not experience cyanobacteria blooms, but in 2018, we started seeing them occur, which resulted in uh, public health advisories and warnings being issued regarding uh, the safety for swimmers to use the, the pond or, or our pets to use the pond. And so we've seen those blooms occur almost annually since, um, or annually since 2018 to some degree. And so in, in order to develop um, a, a pond and lake management plan and, and start to move forward on implementing solutions, the DBW's approach was to take a systematic and science-based approach to target effective management for these ponds. And for Long Pond Marsons Mills, that started in April of 2021, where working with the School for Marine Science and Technology, um, they performed a nutrient diagnostic assessment 
which performs in-lake monitoring. Uh, that includes looking at dissolved oxygen and temperature, uh, collecting water quality samples for total nitrogen, total phosphorus, looking at chlorophyll A pigments in the water, assessing the pH, the alkalinity. They also looked at the phytoplankton composition, which includes cyanobacteria, um, and also assessed uh, sediment regeneration. So they took a look at the sediments to determine if sediments were uh, releasing any nutrients back into the water column. They also looked at our the watershed around Long Pond and assessed, you know, the, the number of septic systems, their distance from the pond, their relative age, and um, to, to decide if they're part of the um, Part of a need to, for management. In addition, they uh, looked at stormwater. Uh, in the case of Long Pond, stormwater uh, pipes had all been eliminated prior to the study, so that actually wasn't um, an, an actively monitored component here. And then they also assessed uh, the surrounding watershed for, for runoff from various parcels. And once they have all that information, uh, which was completed in 2021, they were able to um, assess it and develop nutrient reduction targets to help manage Long Pond Marsons Mills water quality to be protected from cyanobacteria blooms and provide management options that could, could potentially be applied for Long Pond. So in general, Long Pond is um, 54 acres give or take a few um, in, in surface area size. It has a maximum depth of about seven meters. Um, sometimes it's a little less. And it has one semi-public beach that's located on the Long Pond Farms Association. Uh, and it's indicated by the star on this map. There's also a town way to water access through the Long Pond Conservation Area. And Excuse me one minute, the lights do tend to turn off on me because they're automatic, so I will be right back. Uh, hold on. Sorry for that brief interruption. It might happen again, um, but we'll just work through it. So um, it, there is town way to water access through the Long Pond Conservation Area for, for the public. Um, as part of the nutrient diagnostic assessment completed by SMAS, they um, go out on a monthly basis and, and assess the pond water quality for various parameters. Uh, in the case of this study, they actually had two uh, monitoring stations, which are indicated on the map to the right, uh, that are noted as the LP1 and the LP2 uh, water quality stations. These tend to focus on uh, the deep basins of, of the pond. And the different shades of blue on this map actually indicate depth profiles uh, or depth contours in the in the pond. So generally in this pond, in the north end, you can see that we have lighter blues. That's indicating shallower water. And as you move uh, to the more central part, portion of the pond, uh, darker blues, that's actually where we have the deepest basin. And then the southernmost portion of the pond, it's it's somewhat deep, but not as deep as the middle portion of the pond. And so in the two water quality um, monitoring locations, SMAS performed uh, depth profiles for temperature and dissolved oxygen readings over the course of 2021, starting in April and going through October. And what they found in those measurements was that as you, as you move through the year, um, these, these, the temperature in the pond is relatively uh, consistent from top to bottom. So for instance, in April, you're only seeing the green dot. There are other dots um, associated with the half a meter depth, one meter depth, two meter, three meter, four meter. However, the temperature at all those depths was the same. Uh, similar in May, the, the temperature is the same. You can see that there's now uh, occurring in like mid-June, the temperature starts to uh, be warmer at the surface and not quite as warm at the bottom. Uh, but again, 
the the pond in July becomes well mixed, all those dots compress together, and we see that continue throughout the rest of the season. Uh, that's important to note um, because sometimes when temperature is warmer on the surface or colder on the bottom, there might be a temperature stratification develop, which can affect dissolved oxygen conditions. Well, in the case of Long Pond, we actually don't see that. Uh, the dissolved oxygen conditions of this pond also indicate that oxygen uh, is overall well mixed throughout the water column and overall well oxygenated. Uh, throughout the course of the year. In addition, during those um, monthly water quality assessments, SNAS measures uh, the SECI depth, which indicates water clarity, and they also collect water quality samples for things like chlorophyll A pigments in the water. And what they found was that over the course of 2021, the SECI water clarity was very high in the spring at almost 4.5 uh, meters of water clarity in April and decrease to less than two meters of water clarity by um, September, October timeframe. And when you look at the chlorophyll A data, um, which indicates the, uh, it's an indicator for both good and bad algae in the pond. And it's, it, it doesn't distinguish between whether they're good or they're bad. It's just, it's, the, it's whether or not algae are present. And so in the spring, uh, water's cold and um, there's not a lot of algae present in the water column, which is why these dots are so close to zero. But then over the course of the summer, they increase, indicating that the the content of algae in the water is increasing. And you can also see that the water clarity starts decreasing. Um, and so these, these two things um, do have a relationship where as the uh, chlorophyll A content of the water increased, we saw that Secchi water clarity decreased. Um, and so that's interesting because um, we, want, we want to understand more of why, why um, why that water clarity is decreasing and what's causing the chlorophyll A to increase. Well, when looking at the chlorophyll A in the water, like I said, that's an indicator for algae content, both good and bad. But to assess what that um, algae is made up of, the, the School for Marine Science and Technology also collected samples for phytoplankton composition. And phytoplankton includes cyanobacteria. And so in those monthly measurements, which were collected again at these stations, LP1 and LP2, they were able to assess what, um, what species of phytoplankton made up those uh, increasing chlorophyll levels. And so what they saw in the spring through June was that the um, phytoplankton within the long pond water column was largely golden algae. And then as you move into July, that, that composition, composition starts to change to both green algae, indicated by this pale green color, and uh, blue-green algaes, indicated by this brighter green color. And then as you move into August, September, October, the, the phytoplankton community is dominated by blue-greens. And so that's, that's important to mention, um, because that's one of the one of the things that occurs in Long Pond that causes us to post warnings and limit our usage of the pond. Um, but what's interesting here is that in these measurements, which are indicating cell counts of these different phytoplankton species, um, the maximum cell count of the the blue green algae doesn't exceed 15 or 1,500 cells per milliliter. And when we, one of the metrics for posting a public health advisory, um, which is provided by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, is that total cell counts of, if, if total cell counts of cyanobacteria exceed 70 cells per milliliter, then a public health advisory should be closed. Well, it's, it's interesting to see that the middle of the pond doesn't necessarily have the same conditions that we might see on the shorelines. And part of the reason for these two uh, different observations is because certain cyanobacteria are more buoyant in the water column, in particular, the microcystis 
uh, species of cyanobacteria, which which actually tend to float up to the surface and can be um, windblown and accumulate on our shorelines, which is, you know, such as here, uh, we, we did see that occur on the north end of Long Pond. And, and for that reason, in 2021, we had posted a public health advisory due to um, a visible some uh, cyanobacteria scum being evident in the pond. And but even though you can see on July 8th, there weren't necessarily um, a lot of cell uh, cyanobacteria cells within like the central basins of the pond. And so nonetheless, this is still public health concern. And that's why we would post a public health advisory uh, to, to monitor that. But now we want to understand, OK, so what do we need to do to uh, control these cyanobacteria blooms and limit them? Well. Next, we have to look at what these phytoplankton are feeding on. And in this study, the study found that phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in Long Pond, which means that when we have excess phosphorus, it can lead to algae blooms, including cyanobacteria blooms, and that decreased water clarity that we see. And so what's important to like note is that those phosphorus concentrations in the pond from April through October were above 10 micrograms per liter and and so which are indicated here by this red threshold and so if we're going to manage the pond for um, decreased amounts of cyanobacteria blooms we want to manage the total phosphorus levels to be below 10 micrograms per liter and by reducing the amount of food that's available for cyanobacteria we would thereby reduce the occurrence of cyanobacteria blooms. So next we have to understand where is the phosphorus coming from to know what sources to manage. Well, like I said, SMAS looked at the sources that would contribute to phosphorus in Long Pond. Um, and in the case of Long Pond, because there, there are no more stormwater inputs associated with this pond, the majority of the phosphorus is coming from septic systems that are within 300 feet of, of the pond and, so, and, and within the contributing watershed. There's also significant inputs from nat natural atmospheric deposition to the pond surface. Um, these, these things are things like dust or pollen. Um, as they settle on the pond surface, that is contributing some amount of phosphorus to the pond. But this is a load that we can't control unlike storm, septic systems, which are a controllable load. In addition, there's overland runoff from roofs, driveways, impervious surfaces that are near the pond, and those can also contribute uh, phosphorus to the pond. But for the most part, that's a pretty minuscule amount of, of phosphorus to this pond. So in terms of management, we're really needing to focus on um, reducing the phosphorus load from septic systems. And so currently, um, those septic systems are uh, associated with the homes that are basically almost all of the homes that are within 300 feet of the pond. And that's indicated here by the, the bright green uh, colored parcels. Uh, there's roughly 28 of those homes are contributing phosphorus to the pond currently, and that's based on the age of the septic system, the distance from the pond, uh, and the movement of groundwater towards the pond over time. There are three additional septic systems that are indicated in gray here that are not contributing phosphorus at this time, but someday could be, uh, it's just they're too young to be contributing at this time. And so in terms of management of phosphorus from septic systems, the town does plan to sewer these homes in phase three of the comprehensive wastewater management plan. Um, that is still 20 to 30 years away for these homes. And part of the reason for that is just given where the existing infrastructure of our sewer um, system is located and the time it will take for us to reach one of the furthest distances in town, it will still take at least 20 more years. Um, but once sewer is available, the modeling indicates that this will reduce the phosphorus load enough to achieve concentrations below 10 micrograms per liter 
making the pond um, less vulnerable to cyanobacteria blooms. But while we wait 20 years for sewer to be available, there are other options that can be implemented. And so just going along with the septic systems, uh, a potential option that is available to the homeowners who are within that 300 feet of the pond and have septic systems, they can at their option elect to install enhanced phosphorus reducing IA septic systems. And we're suggesting that just because the modeling associated with the SMAS study indicates that the installation of 23 phosphorus removing uh, IA systems would reduce the phosphorus concentration in Long Pond to a level of about 10 micrograms per liter, helping reduce the occurrence of cyanobacteria blooms. Right now, the enhanced phosphorus reducing IA septic systems are a relatively new technology um, and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection regulates the installation of these systems. And right now, um, in order for any IA system to be generally approved, it first has to go through pilot phase and then a provisional phase before it reaches general approval. Um, the only systems available right now are all in piloting uh, approval phase, which means that no more than 15 of any one of the three systems I have listed here can be installed within the state of Massachusetts until it reaches the next phase of, of the MassDEP's um, tiered system. So the systems that are available for people who are interested in it are a phosphorid phosphorus removal system, which claims to achieve a phosphorus effluent of less than one milligram per liter. Uh, the Waterloo ECP phosphorus reduction system um, also claims to achieve less than one milligram per liter in the, the effluent, and a Norico phosphorphate, which actually claims to achieve a 0.3 milligram total phosphorus per liter. Uh, insulation of any one of these systems is not a, re a requirement or mandatory, um, but if you were to want to do it, you would have to uh, go to the town's Board of Health and receive their approval for the installation of a system in, in the town of Barnstable. And so that is something that is available to the private homeowners. Other options that the town can be involved in and would, would have to occur within the pond. Um, and so one example of that is floating treatment wetlands. So floating the idea with floating treatment wetlands is that um, you would take a, a floating uh, material and plant it with uh, native species. And these plants would grow uh, biomass roots, uh, shoots on the surface and roots below in the water and assimilate phosphorus through their roots and into their plant biomass. Later, these plants could be harvested permanently removing phosphorus from the pond. In the case of Long Pond, um, we don't know exactly how effective this would be because there aren't similar examples of uh, floating treatment wetlands being applied in ponds like Long Pond. Um, and, and so looking through uh, the range of, of uh, literature that's available on this, Phosphorus removal by floating treatment wetlands could be anywhere from 0.1 kilograms to 1.8 kilograms per 100 square feet of floating treatment wetland. And so the idea here is that if we were to use this technology, we would want to perform a pilot study to determine the effectiveness of floating treatment wetlands in Long Pond specifically. And so a small scale of this would be something on the order of, you know, deploying maybe three uh, 10 by 10 floating treatment wetlands, which would give you roughly 300 square feet of floating treatment wetland in the pond and allow you to assess that for the phosphorus removal by those plants and determine if it in any way could achieve our phosphorus removal goals. In addition, 
there are things called permeable, permeable reactive barriers uh, that, that could be applied. And I'm going to describe two different types. They're very different. Um, so follow closely, please. Uh, the permeable reactive barrier with iron filings is um, the type of barrier that was in, installed at a Schumann pond in Falmouth. And it was actually installed near shore in the ground to intercept uh, the phosphorus plume from a former wastewater treatment facility. And so these photos on the right, um, you can see that these blue bags are, are holding the pond water out. So they were dewatering the near shore area so that they could dig down and place iron filing barrier, uh, iron filings underground that would intercept that phosphorus plume, um, binding to the phosphorus and eliminating it from, you know, uh, being available within the pond. Uh, this type of installation at Long Pond would be particularly costy, costly and um, have serious impacts to the buffer zone and private residents. It's also not very applicable here because septic system plumes are patchy versus this was a wastewater treatment facility plume and it it was not very patchy. The, the phosphorus plume was very well defined. Um, and so that was that was very effective here. But we also have these other technologies such as temporary um, permeable reactive barriers that are essentially socks with uh, biochar, al al alum or clays uh, that can be installed in some location of the pond to absorb phosphorus into the media within that filter. And then over time have to be replaced because the media has, has um, been used up. And so if that type of technology were to be used in Long Pond, we would again need to perform some kind of pilot study to determine the effectiveness in, um, in achieving management goals in Long Pond. Next, we have algicides. Algicides um, are, are a chemical that can be applied to the pond and it they essentially kill the phytoplankton including cyanobacteria within the pond um, this this has some advantages where it does kill cyanobacteria and has the potential to improve water clarity but it also has disadvantages where it's it's really a band-aid technique so when when you apply it, it, it will work temporarily, but you will need to perform regular treatments in order to um, keep the cyanobacteria from coming back. Uh, it kills good algae and zooplankton in addition to the cyanobacteria, which is uh, not great for the pond's ecosystem. It also has the potential, if a cyanobacteria bloom were already to be occurring, has the potential to lyse cyanobacteria cells possibly increasing the cyanotoxins in the water. And then also, as you kill all this um, good and bad algae, that organic matter goes somewhere and it, it, it becomes deposited on the uh, lake bottom in the sediments. And as it decomposes, if it, if it results in um, low oxygen levels at the sediment water interface, it could result in sediments releasing phosphorus back to the water column, which would potentially feed a cyanobacteria bloom. And next, um, it, it does not remove phosphorus from the pond, and it, it, it has not been previously permitted in a great pond in Barnstable or on Cape Cod, so the permitting for this would be particularly challenging. Real quick, I'm gonna turn the lights back on and I'll be back. Thank you for that. So next we have um, alum aeration, dredging and solar bees. And these you may have heard of um, in some fashion for for different pond and lake management plans. But in the case of Long Pond, none of these are applicable. Uh, this is due to the fact that Long Pond is well mixed throughout the summer. Uh, so with the well oxygenated water column, the use of aeration or solar bees would do nothing to improve 
water quality in Long Pond. In addition, under those aerobic conditions, the sediments in Long Pond are absorbing phosphorus, not releasing it. So the use of alum or aeration or dredging to remove sediments or eliminate um, phosphorus regeneration from sediments are again ineffective. And this is due to um, what we see in the data that was collected as part of the, uh, the, the diagnostic study, which shows in the table here that there were 16 sediment cores collected in, in Long Pond. And each core was incubated under oxygenated conditions where uh, the water column above those sediments had oxygen in it. And when it was oxygenated, the sediments were actually consuming phosphorus. So here, um, this black line indicates zero. And when the blue line is um, moving into the negative zone, it means that sediments are actually consuming phosphorus from the water column into the sediments. Whereas under anoxic conditions, you have both chemical release of phosphorus and anaerobic release of phosphorus, which is indicated by these orange and gray line um, bars. And those being in the positive side indicate that phosphorus is being released back into the water column. And so in the event that Long Pond were to have anoxic conditions, we would see phosphorus coming from these sediments. But in Long Pond right now, we don't have um, low oxygen conditions that would result in phosphorus release. So in conclusion, phosphorus management in Long Pond is necessary to improve water quality. 89% uh, of the phosphorus load to Long Pond was determined to be from septic systems within 300 feet of the pond. Sewering of these homes will occur in phase three, which is years 2040 to 2050 of the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan and will reduce the phosphorus concentration in Long Pond to less than 10 micrograms per liter. Right now, the applicable interim solutions are mostly experimental and need to be initiated as pilot studies to understand the effectiveness of reaching our management goals in Long Pond. The town wants to continue working with the Friends of Long Pond to monitor Long Pond for the purposes of, of adaptive management. Um, and then as an initial effort, we propose to use floating treatment wetlands as a pilot study to assess the feasibility of using them for phosphorus management. And with that, I'd like to open it up for discussion. Um, thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, just now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If, you, um, if you're able to use the uh, raise hand feature, I will call on you or just turn your video on and raise your hand and, and we can call on you that way as well. Um, just let me know. All right, I must have answered all of the questions. Uh, is, is Ed Eichner uh, with us tonight? Yes, Ed is with us tonight. Um, and, and please make yourself known uh, when you speak. Okay, yeah. I'm, uh, my name is Chris Young. I'm the Vice President of uh, Friends of Long Pond. Thank uh, you. We, uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the study that's been done and the, the amount of money that's been put into it. Um, so we find ourselves in a situation where um, whatever the number is, 25 septic systems are creating plumes into the pond. We're a little bit confused about why the, uh, the phosphorus, the legacy phosphorus in, that's in the pond is, is not a, an issue here. And I understand that's because of dissolved oxygen, but how could that possibly change? So we find ourselves in a situation where we're looking at um, our friends and neighbors going, and I'm one of them. Well, we might have to uh, bring, in, bring in some retrofits to your septic system. These would be experimental retrofits. Nobody really knows what the outcome might be, but they might cost twenty dollars to $30,000 to do that. 
And so the question in our minds, number one is, how do we test the ground that is the ground from the septic system to the shoreline to see which septic systems are actually contributing phosphorus to the pond more than others, if you will, so that we could then go back and say, well, maybe these particular ones should be looked at a little bit closer. Are you there, Ed? Uh, yeah, so Ed or Brian, um, would like one of you like to take that question? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, when we go through and we work on looking at the individual septic systems and we're looking at the age and the distance uh, between the leach field and the shoreline, we're looking at a whole bunch of variability related to that. So we, we're testing to see if we have slower groundwater travel time or if we have faster groundwater travel time, if we have more retention of the phosphorus in the, in the sediments or we have less, we're looking at all of those things. And when Amber put up that, that map that showed the properties that are in green, when we go through all of that variability, all of those properties are contributing phosphorus to the pond. Um, and it balances out with what we see in the water column. So what we have estimated coming in from all of those <clears throat> septic systems balances out what we actually see when we go out and we take samples in the pond. So that gives us a lot of confidence that we've done it the right way. We've come up with how all of the, how, how the phosphorus gets into the pond and what we see in the water column. Okay, so uh, that's clear enough. Would you, um, could you clarify on, on which houses may be contributing more more phosphorus, heavier plumes than others? Is there, is there a way to determine that? We haven't gone through and, and looked at individual houses in, in that way. You know, do you think that we would, should do that? That would get down to whether there are two people or three people in each house. And when we've looked, one of the things that we looked at in terms of the variability was, okay, if we had this many people or we had that many people, how much is getting through the aquifer system, how much phosphorus is being retained and then how much is getting to the, to the pond itself. So all of that is incorporated in, in looking at this sort of thing. All right, so you, you would, you would uh, argue that um, basically the, the household uh, measurement, how many people are, are there, how old is the system, will give you a, a clear determination as opposed to actually testing the ground between the septic system and the pond to see which, which of those septic systems are creating a, a, a bigger plume. You could go down that path. That is, that would be a very expensive proposition to try to tag every single septic system plume and the way it moves through the groundwater and the variability of each of those plumes as they wobble on the way to the pond. Part of doing this kind of work is building on the information that's been generated in other similar sandy soil systems to get a good idea of how phosphorus travels so that we can generalize when we look at what's going on in the sandy soils of Cape Cod. Okay, and uh, again, there, there, there's, there seems to be a, kind of a consensus out there that phosphorus doesn't really move through groundwater well. Well, it moves. That's how you get phosphorus into the ponds. That's it, it is slowed down. It takes a lot longer than nitrogen and it takes a lot longer than groundwater. Brian, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I wanted to, to, to maybe just a, the same answer, but in a, with different data. The, the first thing is, is the concept of let's go out and measure the plumes and determine who, you know, which ones are reaching and all of that. Right now, the evidence is that they're all reaching the pond to try to determine their individual strength since the, the aquifer sorption capacity is, is saturated for those systems, 
probably your best bet is just to look at the what goes into the septic system. In other words, the number of per capita in the houses today. And, and that's, since all the sorption's used up, that's pretty much what's going to be getting into the pond in the next year or two from those systems. To try to track those plumes was something that was done in the 80s in a big way for nitrogen. You know, nitrogen, everybody's doing nitrogen on the Cape now. And millions of dollars were spent trying to track plumes like that. It was totally abandoned by the scientific, virtually totally abandoned by the scientific community because it didn't work. The vertical heterogeneity in the aquifer and the horizontal heterogeneity was so great, you would have to take thousands of, of well point samples and assays to get there. So, so it's just not a practical solution. And as long as you have a model that balances, that's that works. <laughs> now, I told you that, that the phosphorus not moving through the aquifer, we did work way back when, and that was the conclusion of the work. As long as the aquifer is not saturated, phosphorus does not move much at all, at least inorganic phosphorus, through the aquifer. We published papers on that that talk about nitrogen versus phosphorus movement. But that's not your case. Your case is you've, you've used up all the SERPs and sites now. And so it is moving through the aquifer. So it's not, there's not a disconnect or an error in what people generally, the consensus is phosphorus doesn't move really through groundwater. That's the disconnect is it moves to the groundwater once all the sorption sites are used up, then it will move freely through the groundwater. Okay. I mean, yeah, through the groundwater. Okay. Amy, you're muted. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a related question. Um, if Brian and Ed, if you were on the board of Friends of Long Pond Marston's Mills and you needed to convince um, neighbors to spend thousands of dollars on upgrading or replacing their septic system, uh, what type of due diligence would you do? What type of additional data would you try and gather to persuade um, the neighbors that, that their home was really contributing greatly to the problem and that they should replace their septic system? Uh, well, I, I think I would, uh, the question really in my mind isn't the question of, of due diligence in terms of characterizing the system. I think the question of due diligence is what would be involved in installing these these alternative septic systems? How much uh, in required in the installation, in the operation, the monitoring, and all of that? And and to be honest, I I think I would look at other alternatives um, other than going through the cost of of installing the system, because in large part, you know on the backside that over the long term, all of these properties are gonna be sewered as, as it currently is planned by the town. So I would try to find other alternatives that are lower cost and probably more temporary that are going to try to address the phosphorus reductions that you need in the, in the interim before those, those properties are, are hooked up to the sewer. Um, I think what we've tried to do is give um, the town a menu of, of potential ways to go about that. We're, we're in the midst of talking with them about other potential ways um, that might be an option. Um, I think we need to sort of work through those. I mean, at this point, the town is, is looking at the floating uh, wetlands as a first step. Um, and I think we'll we'll try to encourage them to look at other alternatives that might be out, out there too. Um, in the on the wastewater side of things, though, um, I don't know that I would want to get myself involved as a as a pilot uh, system at this point. What and other can... alternatives would be number one and two on your list, Ed? Um, I, I think the town has has done a commitment to the the floating wetlands. I think some of the temporary PRB options that are out there, I think you might want to try some of those. Um, there are other, you know, if 
I think if you came along and you had to do some uh, upgrades or replacement on a leach field or something like that, I think that might be part of the solution as well. You move into a different groundwater flow path, uh, the phosphorus has to travel, has to use up all of those binding sites before it gets to the, um, to the pond again. So that might be an option to consider as well. Um, short of going down the path of installing an IA system. And, and can I add to that, that, that one of the options is, is that since you're worried about it's gonna sewer, you have to pay all this money. If you wanna sell your house in the next 25 years before the sewers get in and you're on a cesspool, it would be good to upgrade to Title V and that upgrade would put it in a new leach field and that leach field would remove the phosphorus in the interim time. Uh, from that household until the sewers are brought in. So anybody who has a cesspool, they should be motivated to do it for a variety of reasons, not just pond health. Thank you. Uh, Heather, you had your hand raised up. Yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, one of them was, do we have any idea um, how long it would be before these more advanced septic systems um, kind of become general release or out of the pilot phase? Um, do we have any idea what they cost um, and how long their lifespan is? Um, you know, if if sewers are 20 years out and, and that's, you know, coming anyway, you know, is the, is the this kind of system an investment that is good for 15 years and then maybe it makes sense? Or is this a kind of investment that is supposed to last for 30 years or something? So you may you may be really um, sinking sinking money that's lost. Um, to do this sooner? That's a great question, Heather. And um, I will say each one of the systems I mentioned uh, is different in how it works. So an important step for any homeowner that's interested is to reach out to a professional engineer and have them help you understand which system might be applicable on your property. Um, it, there are essentially a variety of additional tanks, you know, so you have your septic tank, uh, but then the effluent from the septic tank would enter another tank that then has some type of usually proprietary um, media that can adhere to phosphorus, removing it from the uh, wastewater effluent coming out of that tank. And some systems uh, will say that that media needs to be replaced every five years. Um, but in general, there are a lot of measures that a owner has to take in order to monitor these systems because they are so new. And I would say, you know, aside from hiring anyone at this time, you can go to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection website and find these systems listed and they provide information on at least what the system claims to do and how what the system is like. Uh, also, people uh, who work at the Massachusetts Alternative Septic System Test Center, they are they are generally very open to having people out there to view these types of systems on their property so that you can better understand what the system entails and involves in terms of um, installation and monitoring. And they are expensive. Um, you know, I think Chris had mentioned uh, twenty-five to thirty thousand uh, dollars for a system. That seems to be what we're hearing um, as of late. There have been, uh, as as of recent, some grant opportunities. The again, the Massachusetts Alternative Septic System Test Center did have a grant opportunity that would, I think, offset five thousand dollars of the cost of a system to try and motivate individuals to implement these systems. I'm not sure if that grant's available right now, but it'd be worth a discussion with them to see if there are any other uh, financing options for reducing that cost to an individual homeowner, if it's something you're interested in. I had one, one other question, if I may, and that's sure. um, what what is making the sewering uh, plan take so long? And is there any sort of political avenue or option to um, accelerate the, the sewering option, which seems to be the permanent, you know, the permanent solution? 
I, I see Griffin is eager to take this question. I wouldn't say eager, but I'm happy to take the question, Amber. So uh, my name is Gr I just introduced myself. I'm Griffin Bowden, the town engineer for the town of Barksable. Um, really, the the issue is physical distance. Frankly, uh, you know, our wastewater plant's located in Hyannis, uh, off of Versus Way, and Long Pond is frankly about as far in the town away from uh, the plant as you can get. Um, and so, building the infrastructure from not quite the wastewater plant, but from about Finney's Lane is going to pretty soon be the extent of our sewer system all the way out to Long Pond is just going to take time. Um, and and in that time, there's also, frankly, competing interests that have to be addressed in order to uh, maintain permit compliance. Uh, so we have to meet certain goals in, other, in certain watersheds in the town in order to uh, achieve the goals that we committed to in our comprehensive wastewater management plan. So it's a it, it's a physical limitation by the distance away from the plant. Um, that's really a practical reason. And then there's also the permit reason as well, where we have a number of competing areas that we need to address uh, as part of the project. Thank you. Thanks, Griffin. Uh, Ray, you had your hand up next. Hi. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you guys for this uh, really interesting and comprehensive uh, description of the problem and, and what's been done as uh, somebody with sort of minor uh, involvement. It's it's really interesting to see. And um, the I want to sort of second Heather's comment that I looking at it, it just 30 years is way too long. It it's um, depressing to think about that. Um, I'm curious if there's a time frame for how soon we'd be able to figure out whether floating gardens are effective at all. It sounded like that's a, a nice sort of organic, um, possibly easily implementable uh, way to uh, ameliorate the situation. But if if we're talking several, two, three, four years down the road, just to find out if they even work in this situation, that's um, worth considering if if we go that route. And they, the other thing I wanted to know is, are there ways that an individual homeowner without doing a uh, an upgrade for the to the tune of twenty to thirty thousand dollars? What ways can they make immediate individual effect and reduce their own involvement? I personally don't use any kind of lawn fertilizers or if anybody's driven by my house, it's probably the shoddiest looking place on the street. But it, um, I, I just wonder if there are significant ways that as a group we can all come together and, you know, individually try to make things better. And and that would be interesting to hear uh, people's thoughts on. So uh, again, thank you very much for, for the time and it's fascinating. Yeah, thank you for the comments and the question, Ray. I uh, appreciate you attending tonight. So in terms of, um, the floating treatment wetlands, you know, we're really in the initial phases. It's basically conceptual. Like I, sh I showed you the image of what a floating treatment wetland looks like and approximately how large a pilot study site could be. But ultimately we, we would still wanna work with the folks who live here to, you know, properly site it in the pond. Um, you know, things I've learned just by reading are that you can't have it too close to the shore. You want it a little bit in uh, slightly deeper waters. You also want it to be in a place where it's gonna uh, receive as much water movement through it as possible. The more water that those roots interact with, the greater chance of phosphorus absorption into the plant biomasses. Um, it would be at least a couple of years to run through a pilot study. So for instance, if you plant some plants in the spring uh, and then want to assess how much phosphorus th they removed, you need to wait at least until the end of that year. Um, but it might be worthwhile to conduct that type of a study over a couple of years to have a, a better understanding of that removal. So that's something we're you know, still trying to work out all of the details. Um, 
in terms of how that would work, but it would be on the order of a couple of years to understand whether or not they can be used for phosphorus management in Long Pond Marsons Mills. Um, relative to what else a homeowner can do in terms of reducing the phosphorus load to the pond, I think you know you're you're doing a great job if you're not using fertilizers on your lawn, um, and you know just. Any type of erosion uh, in, in those additional fertilizers that folks might place on their lawn, if they get washed into the pond, that's contributing additional load into the pond, which is not is not great. So yeah, eliminating that use of phosphorus uh, on, your, on your soils. Um, also just managing any type of erosion you might have, whether it's shoreline erosion or runoff from your property is good. Um, Making sure that you do maintain your septic system uh, just it, for terms of you don't want it to fail and be bubbling up on the surface and then it rain and that might wash, um, you know, effluent or wastewater into the pond. Uh, usually people will notice an issue in their house before something like that occurs. So it's a, it's a rare condition, but it's still good to maintain those systems. Uh, as Brian noted, if you have a cesspool and upgrading that in your leach field, are good measures, if, especially if it's a particularly outdated system. Um, you know, so there are things like that that folks can do, um, or just you know, be willing to you know help with things like maintaining a floating treatment wetland as well, um, and being good stewards of the pond in that way. Would something like pumping every six months the the septic septic system? pumping it every six months versus every, you know, five years or whenever it fills, does that have any effect at all? So, uh, a, and someone, Griffin, you might want to jump in here if I get this wrong, but essentially your septic tank, once it fills up uh, to its capacity in terms of uh, the water, the sludge is supposed to settle out in the tank and then the water can flow out into your leach field. If you pump it more frequently and the tank is taking more and more days to fill up and you're pumping that, that water out, you are somewhat removing um, phosphorus from reaching the leaching field. But realistically, and, and in some cases, people have to install tight tanks. Like for instance, if they're very close to groundwater, a tight tank doesn't have a leach field which means that you do have to pump that tank very regularly and the phosphorus does not go to a leach field or into the groundwater and reach the pond. Um, but they tend to be generally, I think, inconvenient for homeowners. So you don't see them applied in situations where they're not required. Yeah, I can provide a little perspective to that too, Amber. Uh, thank you. Um, a typical three bedroom home, uh, the design flow for that is about 300, 330, 330 gallons per day. Um, your septic tanks about 1500 gallons per day or should be 1500 gallons per day for a title five system. So if you pump that down, it only takes five days to a week or so to fill it back up. And at that point, you're contributing into the le leaching field again. So uh, there is a short period of time there where, um, you know, you're not contributing as a result of pumping the septic system entirely down, uh, but you'd really have to do it every week or two um in order and effectively manage it as a tight tank to prevent nutrients from entering the groundwater thank you very much for the for the info it's uh, fascinating thank you uh rick would you like to ask your question next um yes i know one of your presentations mentioned the temporary method of uh using algicide and um it also showed that uh oxygen would be lowered in the in the uh, the pond, and I just wondered if it would possibly have a potential then to kill fish or perhaps the freshwater clams that we have, and actually cause more problems than we have. Uh, that's a, another great question, Rick. So uh, it's it is important to consider those factors when using algicides in any uh, pond. Uh, you can find examples in extreme uh, situations where ponds have a probably a lot more algae, um, that if you kill that off and it results in a, a very large mass of organic matter settling to the sediments and consuming 
all of the oxygen in the pond, you might result in a fish kill. Uh, in the case of mussels, they're a little more vulnerable because they don't move as quickly. A fish can generally find another place in the water to, to, to that has oxygen. Um, so you do want to be considerate of those things. Um, and, and honestly, it's the impacts are not well understood for each pond unless unless you perform the activity. Generally, restrictions are required in the permitting process that limits you to 30 or 50% of the pond area. Um, no more than that can be uh, treated at any one time to avoid effects such as uh, what you stated. So it is a consideration that needs to go along with using something such as algicides. Okay, thank you. Um, Brett. Um, yeah, this goes back to, I think, my uh, misunderstanding of what Ed Eichner was saying, because I thought he was saying just now that that he was he would not suggest uh, replacing existing septic systems with these um, experimental systems. Uh, but I, I was unclear what he was suggesting. So maybe this is addressed to him. Uh, yeah, so I think real quick. Just remember there is a difference between your existing septic system leach field and the innovative advanced alternative septic system uh, that that could be implemented in its place. And so I'll turn it over to Ed. So what I was saying was that with uh, the alternative systems that are out there, they're, they're essentially uh, twice the cost of uh, a standard Title V system. So the question is, are there ways to do, are there ways to reduce the amount of phosphorus that's getting into the pond from the wastewater uh, that are less expensive? And we've talked a little bit about moving, Brian mentioned the cesspools, replacing the cesspools. That's essentially putting in a new leach field, which creates a different phosphorus flow path for to get to the pond. And that's so that's going to have the delays that we see for phosphorus for some of the ponds that are close. I mean, some of the properties that are already close to the pond, but they've got younger septic systems. And so they're not impacting the pond at this point. So the, the idea is if if you could do something at a lower cost, I would say probably moving your or replacing your your leach fields um but i'm not saying that that's definitely something that you should do these are things i i think that you need to consider on an individual basis about ways to do this um and whether you treat the the, the phosphorus coming in from the watershed or whether you treat the phosphorus that's already in the pond um, right now, the town is is trying to figure out ways that they things that are within their control to deal with things in the pond, the phosphorus in the pond at this point. Right. So, thank you for that. So, uh, so you know, I'm I'm one of these uh, 28, 29 systems. I live at the north end of the pond, and I would like to do what I can to help alleviate the problem. And it sounds like moving my leach field would be an option that's uh, going to be less uh, expensive than replacing the entire septic system. And, and what you say makes a lot of sense to me, I guess, two questions, approximately, what's the price range for doing that? And second, is any assistance from the town available to help defray that, whatever that cost is? So... Well, I, it, it, go ahead, Amber. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say in in terms of uh, assistance from the town, uh, this is all within private property. So the town is not able to spend public dollars on private properties. And, and so we're I, I, not I've, able to to perform those upgrades for you. I've, I've heard I've heard that, Amber. and what what confuses me is that, we're talking about saving the pond, which is a public property, and the fact that work 
in order to do that might be done on private property. I don't quite understand why that's a restriction. But um, putting that aside, how, how much does replacing your leach field cost? In I large part, that, that I can speak to that. It really depends okay, Griffin. upon your pro personal property, how far you're moving it, assuming you don't need a pump, um, assuming you don't need to replumb basements and stuff like that. Uh, assuming it's a relatively, let's call it a clean move where you just are repiping, uh, um, it can be on the under ten thousand um, dollars, but or but around that price point. Yeah, I mean, part of, part of it is going to be whether you have the room on your property to put in a new leach field, which was Griffin was saying the, a clean move. You know that some people I know don't have that kind of room on their property, um, but you know that that's an individual kind of engineering discussion that you're going to have to have. And and again, with is, with the town assist with helping with the, solving those engineering problems. Um, so Brett, Brett, one thing I can speak to on that is we certainly can't design your septic system for you. Anything like that, you would, if you were gonna replace your septic system, you would have to retain an engineer to do that. However, we're happy to come out and take a look from a feasibility perspective to see if we could try to assist here um, in, in any manner that we can. Again, we can't design your system for you, but we can try to help walk you through what possibilities there may be at your specific site. We're happy to do that to try to help facilitate this, this issue. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Griffin, uh, can I ask you a question on that very point? Uh, doesn't the Board of Health have to do, or aren't they empowered to do surveys of whether you have a Title V system or, or a cesspool? Or is that I'm, I'm not aware that that uh, requirement exists or not. That, would, that, that, would, health that would only, Brian, that would only be at, at, at a transfer. transfer. Yeah. No, no, but I didn't mean it was a requirement, but other towns are surveying their septic systems. They're doing, conducting those surveys for nitrogen in other towns, not Barnstable. And so, and they're using town employees, I believe, to do it. I don't know how they do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware that that's something that's happening uh, in the community. That would be a question for the health department at this point. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jane, you've had your hand up, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm not one of your neighbors on Long Pond Marston's Mills. I live on Long Pond in Centerville, but... Um, we have started, we don't have, we don't have a lot of answers, but we have a system if anybody wants to come see it. Amy and Chris have been out here to see a, uh, an IA system that we are hosting a pilot for. It was uh, put in under a grant. It's, a, it's a, called Fuji Clean, and it's, um, it's being piloted at the state, so it's not available for purchase. We were gifted the unit we paid for the installation. It takes the same footprint or slightly smaller than our pre-existing septic and uses the same leach field. We, 20,000 in Japan. It costs- 20,000 in oh, Yeah, they're already 20,000. It's, it's made by a Japanese company, Fuji Clean, sounds very Japanese. They've been in business for several decades, I believe, and about 20,000 of this particular unit are in, installed in Japan, uh, initially for nitrogen. What's interesting about our system is that it's the first one for this company in the US that they've installed in the US that is, is uh, designed to remove not only nitrogen or reduce not only nitrogen, but uh, phosphorus as well. And the way it's done is with um, uh, iron plates that have a current running across them and the, the phosphorus binds to the iron and, and precipitates out, and that needs to be pumped out uh, periodically. We are literally at the beginning of it. We've had sort of our first measurement. It took a little while. They're, they're not just the same simple tank in the ground going to the leach field. There is a, there is a, um, a circulation pump, uh, and there also has to be power to the electrolysis plate. So, there are electrical hookups in terms of the, and the installation 
was a little bit tricky. We we're the first ones. Um, we didn't have somebody looking over our shoulder, walking us through. So I was working with our electrician and on a FaceTime call to the uh, manufacturer up in Maine uh, because everything was in Japanese and the instructions. We, we had pictures, but anyway, long story. It, it's supposed to work quite well. The, the nitrogen only version of this has been installed um, quite widely in Suffolk County, Long Island, the end of Long Island, which is very similar to Cape Cod. They're very happy with the nitrogen only part. So um, if anybody would like to come and see it and hear more about our experience, we really don't have any data to share with you because we're again, literally at the beginning of the monitoring uh, phase of it, but um, happy to throw that out as, as another educational op option for you. Um, and my, I've, I've thought about this problem quite a bit and we've been on the Cape five years. We lived in several places in, the, in a military career, including other towns and cities that have worked on uh, water issues from different perspectives. And one thing that I came away from, from a, about 10 years in San Antonio was that if you reduce, if you do water conservation, if there's less water flowing through the system, there's gonna be less, uh, maybe, you know, different concentration, but there's gonna be less volume running this material, any of the material that, that survives beyond your septic tank. There's gonna be less volume to run into your aquifer, into your water table, or to have to be paid for and pumped by your sewer system. So I'm a huge advocate and practitioner of water conservation, regardless of what solution you use. And, and the other, the other <clears throat> options are, let's think about, you know, we, in public health, we call it, let's think about the upstream solutions. Let's think about reducing uh, the amount of, of phosphorus and nitrogen that get into these septic systems. So maybe you maybe you split your black water and your gray water. Maybe you have dual parallel plumbing systems in your house. And on the surface, that sounds like, oh my gosh, how are we gonna do that? But some of the modern fixtures for urine diversion and for composting are amazingly similar to the fixtures you're already using. Um, and I think having, <laughs> having gone through the installation of an, of an IA system this summer with the permitting and the excavation and so forth, that uh, if you realize how much is involved with that or with sewering, some of these other solutions may be more palatable. And I think we're gonna have some real um, options to see how other parts of the country deal with this. As we watch the Western states have no water at all. They're not going to be able to use water in their in their uh, waste system. They're going to have to come up with dry systems or systems that recirculate their water. So there may be some breakthroughs in other parts of the country before the 30 years that our septic or that our sewering system is planned to get to the whole Cape. So Sorry for rambling on there, but I do I do extend that invitation and Amy and Chris know how to get in touch with me. And so does Amber, if you'd, if you'd like to come over and, and just hear more about what we, we're at the very beginning and MassTech is, is you know, our, they're our guide. <laughs> they're, they're leading us through this. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Jane. And uh, we appreciate you opening up your home to uh, show people your system and, and what you've been through to get that installed. Um, very forward thinking of you. Thank you. David, would you like to speak? Yes, I would. Thanks, Amber. And I apologize for the fact that I'm not on screen. I'm just not the place where I can I can be on screen. Um, thank you all, uh, Amber, and all the folks at the town, and yes, Mass, for, uh, folks, for all the work you've done uh, for the thorough, thorough analysis. And we've uh, uh, I won't say enjoyed working with you. We've enjoyed you, but unfortunately, we're not happy we have to work on this issue. Um, my question goes to the part of your presentation where you talked about algicides and um, uh, with the conclusion that um, they kill um, you know, the other flora and fauna um, as well. 
And my question goes specifically to hydrogen peroxide, where there are studies which we shared, which um, show that they actually, the hydrogen peroxide actually selectively goes after the cyanobacteria, uh, and especially with dosing uh, these uh, other flora and fauna safe. Um, and I just want to know what your reaction to that is specifically with respect to hydrogen peroxide, and if you are aware of studies which say otherwise. Yeah, so I have reviewed some of the information um, in literature studies on the hydrogen peroxide-based algicides. Uh, not all of them, there are many, uh, and those, those studies can be uh, very involved in everything that they look at. But, you know, my general takeaway is, uh, who is proving that they're selective? Um, generally, that's something that's claimed, but there isn't a lot of information that supports it. Um, and mostly because they, they don't necessarily monitor for all those other constituents that's, that show uh, zooplankton is not affected. You can find studies that will talk about dosing of, of hydrogen peroxide, um, so dosing, meaning lower doses of the hydrogen peroxide-based algicide or higher dosage, and how that affects things like daphnia, which are zooplankton that occur in the water. Uh, lower doses may have no effect, but as you move into higher doses, they may have uh, negative effects on those zooplankton. And so, yes, in large part, you do have to consider your dosing in order to, to manage whether what you're going to be uh, killing off. Um, the other thing I've seen in some of these studies is they might have a pond that's much worse than long pond Marsden's Mills and maybe hyper eutrophic, which means that it has a lot more nutrients in it and is experiencing far worse uh, cyanobacteria and algae blooms than what long pond Marsden's Mills is experiencing. And sometimes uh, they'll even measure things like the microcystin toxin. And they'll show that it does, de using the algicides does decrease that amount of microcystin toxin available, but it doesn't decrease the level to below the Massachusetts Department of Public Health threshold of eight parts per billion. Um, in general, you know, Long Pond Marsden's Mills, just in this past year, 2022, we did see Again, cyanobacteria blooms occurring, but for the first year we had regular uh, mm -hmm. microcystin toxin monitoring. And for the most part, all but one of the samples collected this past summer were below eight parts per billion microcystin. So with the exception of that one uh, sampling date, the pond um, doesn't, doesn't have the same conditions that maybe make us think that it's as bad uh, and requiring the use of algicides as, as we might think. And so with that, I think it would be preferable to implement solutions that have a better chance of removing phosphorus, reducing the phosphorus load in the problem, and giving us longer term effects in terms of water quality improvement in the pond compared to having to use, use algicides on a more frequent basis and not fully understanding what kind of long term effects that could have on uh, the pond's ecosystem, mussels, fish, uh, sediment, biogeochemistry, uh, versus these other solutions that don't necessarily come with the negative, uh, the question of negative effects. Yeah, I mean, I so I mean, I completely agree with you that we can't lose focus on the long on the long term solutions, and we should. I'm not at all suggesting that algicides are an alternative. Um, it's more an interim bridge. It, it, it's 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 hydrogen peroxide is very inexpensive. Uh, it could be it could be a bridge to buy you two or three years until you do the floating wetlands and the like. And you're talking about a concern about um, their impact, and that needs to be explored. And we should have that discussion further and talk to experts further. Um, so I, that's why I agree with that. But you're weighing that against a known poison that's already in the pond. Uh, so I just I, it's just not clear to me why we just flat out reject hydrogen peroxide without further discussion. I guess I just hope that we can have that further discussion. I'll stop then. Yeah, and I am happy to discuss it further with you, David. Um, you know, we, we can definitely bring this up offline. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Paul. Uh, hi, thanks. And um, 
Sorry if uh, I missed this in the presentation or if this is already known to everybody, but you'd mentioned that um, the town of Barnstable had prioritized three ponds and uh, I believe it was Shubail Pond you'd completed earlier this year. Was that a similar type of issue? So in terms of the issue, uh, phosphorus, excess phosphorus within the pond was the issue. The source of that phosphorus um, was from both largely from septic systems and the internal uh, sediments. A little bit of phosphorus was also from stormwater inputs to Shubal Pond. So we have, in the case of Shubal, different management options that can be applied. So for instance, what was recommended there and we're proceeding with is to perform an alum treatment to control the uh, internal sediment phosphorus regeneration that occurs in Shubal Pond. By doing that, we'll reduce that part, portion of the phosphorus load, reducing the overall amount of phosphorus available for cyanobacteria blooms. We're also going to advance on improving uh, stormwater inputs uh, to reduce the amount of phosphorus that comes in through those inputs. Uh, doing both things is not going to get Shubal Pond below that 10 microgram per liter threshold that we want to see for managing uh, phosphorus levels and cyan cyanobacteria blooms, but it's going to get us closer until mm -hmm. we can bring sewer to the, the homes that are contributing within the upgradient watershed. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Blair. Hi, so... Uh... How far do the leaching fields have to be away from the pond to be effective? Uh, I'm going to give this one to Ed. Thank, Thank you. you. So the the travel time for uh, phosphorus in it, it depends on um, the material. It depends on the the, the speed of groundwater. Um, roughly, you're talking about 70 or 80 years to go about 300 feet. So um, that's that's how long the phosphorus is going to take to get from the from the shoreline to wherever it's going. So if we had to move our leaching fields, what's the recommended, you know, as far back as you can is basically the, the recommended so idea. over 300, basically, if you can get there. Yeah, I mean, it, it always comes down to the, to the configuration of your lot relative to where the pond shoreline is. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, James, is your hand raised? Yes, hello. Um, uh, first, I wanna thank you all for doing the uh, groundwork, if you will. Um, I appreciate all that effort. But I have a question that goes back to the one of the original slides you had tonight, um, where it showed that the uh, um, contributing lots were all around the north part of the lake, uh, didn't show anything on the south part of the lake. Um, and that brought to mind uh, about maybe more than 10, 15 years ago, I went to a presentation where they talked about the groundwater in our area and the aquifer. And um, it, at that point, they said the aquifer flowed from north to south. So, which makes sense, given what the slide you're showing. But it also brings the question, north of the uh, lots that are abutting the lake, we have many houses and a giant golf course that are they, are they contributing as well down into the groundwater that flows under our lake and, and our lake is spring fed. So it has to come up. Does that, is it contributing? And is it being taken into consideration? Those are, those are great questions, James. And so, um, you know, some things to consider are one, the, the movement of phosphorus through the ground is much slower than nitrogen through the ground. So nitrogen moves about as fast as groundwater. It moves with the groundwater. Uh, and yes, in this case, on the south side of our town, there's actually a groundwater divide. Um, some water on the north side flows towards Barnstable Harbor. In your case, it's flowing uh, from north to south towards the three bays. Um, the phosphorus 
binds naturally to the iron in the Cape Cod sands, and that slows down its movement through the ground and into the groundwater, uh, or with the groundwater. Generally, um, most of the time, anyone with a, a septic system has to replace their septic system in leach field on the order of 25 to 30 years. And that's approximately the time frame it, it takes for the, the phosphorus to move 300 or more feet and, and be reaching a pond. So if you're beyond that 300 foot range or, or at the golf course, for instance, you're not contributing phosphorus to the pond because you're so far away that even though you have a septic system and there is going to be phosphorus moving um, from that septic system from north to south, it by the time it, you need to replace your leach field, you're resetting the clock on that phosphorus removal. And so it never has an opportunity to go as far as the pond. And if anyone else wants to jump in there, they feel free. One more question. Um, this may be very simplistic and I apologize, but if we as individual homeowners, sounds like iron filings or iron is the solution or a, a help. So if we as individual homeowners injected iron filings into our own leaching systems, would that help? Or is that just stupid? Uh, I, can, I can address that. It's an, an interesting concept. James and I, and the, I frankly, there are people that are looking into similar technology such as that, that we are aware of. I would not encourage doing that at this time because it's frankly not allowed to do that into your septic system. Um, however, uh, if that's something you're interested in, you'd have to talk with the health department and get a, a approval from Board of Health and DEP, um, which I don't think you would be able to get at this time. Um, however, there are people that are looking into that general concept, and and I think you're you're heading in the right direction with the with the theory there, uh, but the the technology is not quite there. Okay, the tech sounds like the technology is nowhere. Um, the I have it I'm listening carefully, and I know I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I haven't heard a solution yet. I haven't heard a solution, or even a path to a solution. All these um, the the additions or uh, adjustments we can make to our home septic systems. They're experimental. There's 15 of them in the whole state. I, I haven't heard anything that I can do as a homeowner today. Am I, am, did I miss something? The solutions relative to Long Pond are very limited um, to, partic in particular, the septic addressing septic system phosphorus loads that are within 300 feet of the pond. Um, you know, the, the other solutions available, such as the, um, you know, temporary uh, PRBs, you know, the deploying different filter socks into the pond that could absorb to the phosphorus or the use of floating treatment wetlands. They're experimental because we don't know exactly how much phosphorus they're going to be able to absorb and remove in order to be effective. Um, for instance, some, some metric measurements would indicate that we need 10 acres worth of floating treatment wetlands for in order for them to be effective. But that's not practical. You know, so that's why those types of things would start off as pilot studies to determine if they are a feasible solution in the short term. And then long term, the solution is to sewer those homes and address that phosphorus load so that it doesn't impact the pond anymore. Um, and in the meantime, it's just doing as much as we can to not create more of an issue for Long Pond. Um, I will say, while we're experiencing cyanobacteria blooms on an annual basis, the, the conditions may not be as, as bad as we thought, you know, especially as we are collecting more and more data to better understand our health risks associated with using our, our water bodies um, when cyanobacteria are present. Um, cyanobacteria, and let's, let's, I didn't cover this previously, cyanobacteria are naturally occurring in all lakes and ponds. It's just a matter of if they reach a concentration that becomes uh, detrimental to our health. And so that's when we raise the public health concern flags. And so if anything, we want to try and find a way to manage our interactions with the pond so that we can use the pond as much as possible without 
experiencing public issues to our, our health. And, and so as we move forward, we're definitely going to keep our eyes open to any options that we, we can deploy to, to make uh, Long Pond usable uh, for people as much as possible. Uh, Paul. Uh, I thought of another question. So sure. given the slow movement of phosphorus uh, through, uh, through the, uh, the aquifer, if all houses on the north end were sewered tomorrow, how long would it take for all of the residual phosphorus to kind of work its way through the system and not be a problem anymore? Yeah. Hey, Brian, would you like to take that question? Uh, perfect. Thanks, Amber. Uh, yeah, the, the thing is that as much as the phosphorus is uh, bound to the soil, the iron in the soil, that then all that has to happen in those sites is for the groundwater just to flush the dissolved phosphorus that's residual in that, that pore space into the pond. And that is not very long because 300 feet is not a very long travel time for, you know, we're talking a year, two years, that kind of thing. The only place where it does become a little bit difficult to calculate is if you have any places in the aquifer right adjacent your leach field that have anoxia. And in those cases, it, then it'll be a little slower, but in, you should get in a year or two a very quick drop in the phosphorus load. Because what's sorbed is going to stay sorbed and you're only getting rid of the water with its dissolved phosphorus in it. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, do we have any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Oh, uh, there might have been one. Oh, Katie, hi. Yes, please. What is your question? You're muted. Unmute, okay. Just really quickly, um, sort of to the point of what can we do right now? Because I think we're all probably pretty frustrated about the lack of you know, immediate solutions, how we can, as individuals, contribute to the health of the pond. Does it make any difference, of course, not using any um, uh, pesticides or any chemicals on our lawns, but what about household products? Does that make any difference if they're low phosphorus or plant-based or non-detergents? Does that make any difference in the, the levels in the pond? So interestingly, um, the state of Massachusetts has banned phosphorus from being within our soaps and detergents and household products. So if you actually look at the labels on a lot of the products you use in your house, you won't find phosphorus. Uh, and you might even find a no phosphorus uh, like symbol. And that's because it, the, the regulations have banned it from being used within the detergents for the purposes of reducing the amount of phosphorus in our wastewaters. And, and also, I had just read a, a piece in uh, WBR today about how Title V, there's going to be some amendments to it, but does that only relate, and on Cape Cod in particular, um, with, re with relation to, you know, having homeowners be required to update um, septic systems, but is that only on the coast, or is that... I can, I can address that, Amber. Yeah, so the proposed could. regulations are really 100% relative to nitrogen. Um, so they're they're defining nitrogen sensitive areas and trying to remove nitrogen to deal with the nitrogen issues in the coastal abatements. So the changes really aren't addressing this issue, unfortunately. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thanks very much. You're and I need to add something that Griffin, I agree with you 100 percent, except to the extent that that in certain areas you're going to be forced to do uh, sewering. Uh, and if those areas contain lakes and ponds, which a lot of them do, you'll you'll get the benefit of the sewering, getting rid of the phosphorus in those areas. So and I'll add on to that. Right? I mean, Town of Barnstable's, my read of the proposed regulations is in pretty good position because we have an approved comprehensive wastewater management plan, which is yeah. a watershed approach. Um, and based upon how the proposed regulations are written, if you have those things, everybody's not going to be required to upgrade to IA systems. But right. if a community does not have those things, frankly, every single septic system will be required to upgrade to a nitrogen reducing septic system. So um, by having a comprehensive wastewater management plan and addressing the nitrogen issues, frankly, via sewering, um, 
we're preventing that from being an obligation for every every resident within the town. No, I, I agree. Marsples is doing a stellar job in terms of its nutrient management of its estuaries and now its ponds. I was just saying that a lot of those areas that'll be sewered for nitrogen also have intervening ponds. And so the ponds will benefit from the fact the wastewater will be taken out of the septic tanks and shipped off for treatment and not returned to that watershed necessarily. So you get a benefit. There will be some benefit, but it just won't be targeted on the ponds. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additional questions, comments? All right, well, hearing none, uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time tonight to have a very thorough discussion regarding um, the, the options that we have for managing Long Pond Marsons Mills. I know it, it maybe doesn't seem like uh, there's a silver bullet here, but I think working together is what we all will need to do in order to um, you know, try to reach a solution that best suits Long Pond Marsons Mills and, and its users. Uh, so again, I thank Brian, uh, Ed, Griffin for all being here tonight um, and, and all of the discussion that we've been able to have. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Amber. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Griffin.